welcome to the Kuimungay Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Rivera, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and of course, on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we wanna thank you for joining us today. The Kuimungay Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization it's committed to researching consciousness in the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of the deeply human connection to all of life. And it's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take a very open approach and invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, full spectrum of topics from neuroscience and anthropology, archeology, span archeoastronomy, eco-spirituality, philosophy, psychology, mythology, shamanism, ritual, the hero's journey, the roots of theater. It goes on and on and on from the arts to the sciences and so much in between. And we want you to join us. Uh, we have most of these presentations are available on our website. We have like over a hundred webcasts and a hundred podcasts that are available for your enjoyment, all are free. And um, of course, as a nonprofit, we wanna invite you to become a supporting member, join our community circle. And we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queer Monkey Institute. Well, today, our guest takes us on a journey of exploration and how she found that intersection of divine feminism, uh, religion, roots of language, which all were inspired by her own personal quest for healing. And as she puts it, exploring the F word in religion. <laughs> well, you know, write to us and tell us that you have discovered that postures make a difference oh, yeah. looking at an ancient artifact and you have our attention. Tell me that you had a forum entitled Feminism and Religion and my ears are buzzing. Join our CI circle our Kuimunga Institute Circle. Hey, we are friends for life. And show me your new book, your autobiography titled Desperately Seeking Persephone about your own journey to the underworld and back, your own shamanic initiations. Oh, well, we are here now. <laughs> so, and then I just learned that our guest has an additional three books titled One Gods, The Mystic Pagan Guide to the Bible, when Eve was a goddess, the shamanic view of the Bible. When Moses was a shaman, a pagan guide. Um, uh, wow. Uh, we've got so much to talk today uh, about with uh, Janet Rudolph. Um, Janet, welcome. She joins us from New York State. So I knew you were a scholar. I just didn't know that you're author of four books, not just the one. So you've been holding back on us. So Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, um, tell us about where we began. Uh, you and this institute began with uh, an email and saying, hey, we just heard about you. Um, How did we've you been exploring uh, yeah. postures and why it makes a difference. Tell, let's begin there. Well, I'm a, I'm a twice ordained shaman. And my second ordination was from, is from Aloha International as an alakai, which is a Hawaiian spiritual guide. And in that vein, I've been guiding a Kakua group for about three and a half years. Kakua means service. Mm -hmm. And it, the, I, the, the purpose is for, to do distance healing, to send good works out into the world. And it's, it's, we've, we've had a marvelous group of women and men who, who we've experimented. Every time we've had a chance to explore spiritual journeys, we've gone off in many different directions. And recently there was an exhibit at the, in, in New York City at the Morgan Museum, although the Morgan Library and Museum of Enhe Duana. And Enhe Duana is, was the first named writer in history. She's yeah, about, I'm gonna say 4,000 years ago, and she's a woman, which actually people make a big deal about, but really 
in those days, it probably wasn't a big deal, but okay, we can, that's another, another topic. But so we went to this exhibit and there were uh, many uh, statuettes of priestesses or just women of the temple. And they were all standing with the same hand position. And so it was, it was, and it was so powerful just to stand in front of these objects and, and take in that energy. So we started, we started holding the hand position and it's one that you've done since then it's, it's holding the hands like this. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we found such, such power in, in holding that position. So I, I, we, 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 we've explored it with, with the group. And then I wrote up a blog post for this feminism and religion website that you mentioned. And one of our readers who actually I saw her name up here, Judith, so I'll shout out, a shout out to her, wrote to me and said, you know, there's a whole institute in Arizona that studies this. And I was, I was captivated right away. So that's when I wrote to you and said, hey, guys, here's, here's what we've been doing. What do you think? And that's how we got started. You said, you guys said, yes, that's a ritual instruction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from the experiences that you had with the group to when you have it with with our community, what what did you note? Well, we, we don't we did it a little bit differently. We've explored we, we explore positions in the context of picking up energies of the universe. And we don't like you do it with a whole ritual. Our mm -hmm. our Kakua ritual is only an hour, so we're, we don't have the time and we. Mm -hmm. To, to do it to do it in the ritualistic way that you do and you also study it a little more than we do we ours is more of an experiential mm -hmm. work so we so the experience has been powered and we felt that this position the one that i i referenced is is almost like a little battery pack yeah mm -hmm. so it not only gives energy but that energy flows through so if we're going to do any hands-on healing or distance healing because it all comes through our hands which right. is something I'll talk about a little bit later. Yeah. It all comes, it's a way to power up, as it were. Yeah. 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 And then um, the experience with our group was was a different. Right. Uh, because we do it, we spend more time, time. You know, there's a, the whole ritual preparation and then spending the more time. It allows you to, to get into that trance. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. And yeah. go through the, and, and experience the thresholds in a different way. Uh -huh. yeah. So shamanism is a thread that has really carried you through your whole life from you mentioned a couple of initiations and then the Hawaiian and then uh, this and even the titles of the books that you've written uh, yeah. really are from a shamanic perspective. And may we yes. go back to the beginning a little bit because I know your personal story of healing is at the roots of all of this exploration that you've gone on and that you were, you were searching, you were trying to heal within, you were trying to have, find wholeness. And this is what. But even titling your book is after Persephone, the goddess that goes to the underworld yeah. and then is rescued and brought yeah. back up. Mythic in so many ways right. applies to so many of. But how does that apply to you? And can you tell us a little bit about your, sure. your journey? Yeah, of course. I, I, as many people in the society, I had a very violent childhood uh, until I probably stepped out of it in my early 20s. And I was broken at that time. And I was looking, uh, desperately looking, desperately seeking any pathway to, to, to be comfortable in the world, to be comfortable in my body, to, to understand the world. And, and I started on this healing path. I, I didn't really recognize it for many years. And it wasn't until 1996, so I would have been in my 40s already, that I consciously embarked on a, on a shamanic pathway. And I did that because I got very, very sick. I, I got bronchitis and I, I just kept getting bronchitis. Like it never completely cleared up. For, and the doctors, of course, were giving me antibiotics and I was just getting sicker and the antibiotics were making me sick. Mm. And, and a dear friend of mine dragged, literally dragged me up to Maine where there were a husband and wife shamanic team were teaching. And, I, and, and in their workshop weekend that we went up, they healed me. Hmm. And, and I like literally signed on the dotted line at that moment, I became their apprentice and I stayed with them for 17 years. When you say they healed me, what does that mean? Because really the healing comes from within. Maybe they they healed, but yeah, you're totally right. They healed the bronchitis is what they did. 
Mm. And it's true, this bronchitis will come back or something else could have come back had I not continued to do my own work. Yeah. Because you're right, you have to do your own work for it to, for the, to continue. So, and then uh, what happened after 17 years? Then you found Hawaiian shamanism? So the, it's, it's hard to put it into words because these are very beloved teachers of mine, but they went down a path that was very authoritarian. Mm. And as Serge put it, um, Serge Kahili King is the, the founder and leader of Aloha International. And, and his, he puts it, there's two main types of, of shamanism. There's warrior shamanism and there's adventure shamanism. And these teachers really were warrior shamans. And as I got healthier, you know, the irony was their work helped me become healthier. And they're very, very powerful shamans in their own right. But as, they, as I became more powerful and got to know myself better, I was like, this warrior pathway is not for me. Mm -hmm. And so our parting, our parting was not a loving parting, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but, but, but it gave me room, it gave me space to then mm -hmm. go out into the world and try out different systems. And I had known, they had originally taught Serge from Serge's uh, first book, Urban Shaman. So I, I knew of Serge's work and I, I had known of it for 30 years, but, but, and I, and I realized how much his pa pathway had helped me out without my realizing it came from him. Uh, so I sought him out and I wrote him a letter and I said, thank you. You know, I, this has been amazing. And then one thing led to another and I went to Hawaii <laughs> and started studying with him. Uh, and, and I love it because it's adventure shamanism and it's looking at life as an adventure. Yeah. With a warrior, you're looking at it a little different because there's a fear base that you have to protect yourself or you have to fight something. Mm -hmm. Where adventure mm -hmm. is more you're, you're going in with open arms and open heart mm -hmm. to explore. Do you feel like where you were, where you started your journey, you said you were broken. Do you think that the warrior gave you the strength or you had to battle some, some quote demon? Do you feel like that was the recipe that you needed then to evolve to adventure? That's a really great question. And I'm not a hundred percent sure how to answer that because that is the path I took. I absolutely treasure the teachings and I use them every day. So I do treasure the teachings that, that I learned from them. They're very special. They're very powerful. And I, and I learned, it was like going to college. I learned a, a, such a broad range of shamanic knowledge. Oh, go ahead. Well, no, where's the intersection now? Because as, as, as this yeah. thing evolved for you and this journey unfolded for you, um, the story of your own personal thing just became more and more important. And that's how... You, you how did you find that things. apply the shamanism to the bible because you're writing about eve and moses and so you actually, so the bible was actually old pagan wisdom mm -hmm. that was that was written down it was written down at the at the with the the diaspora and they the babylonian diaspora and they they had to take this knowledge with them but the problem was patriarchy had already taken hold so the scribes who wrote this knowledge down had a point of view and they tried to hide a lot of the knowledge. So I, and I always knew, I just always knew from my earliest days, I was just like, there's hidden knowledge here in the Bible. And, but I didn't really know how to access it until I started the shamanic path pathway. And I was like, these are shamanic lessons. These are some shamanic teachings. Or you could say universal teachings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What what so kind of a background did you grow up in? So I I am I am ancestrally Jewish, although I never really we were, never went to temple. I grew up in a religion called ethical culture. What is that? I've never heard of that. It, it's a it's a it's, it was founded by a man named Felix Adler who was a rabbi, and he there, there's two strains of it. One is is social action. So the, so the 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 earliest founders. It's only about 150 years old. So the earliest founders delved very deeply into social action and very intellectual pursuits. Mm -hmm. But Felix Adler also had a very mystical side of him. And I, and I was, of course, drawn to his mystic side. And I, I always so, but, but, the, but I, I wasn't felt that, I, that what I was seeing was always welcome there. Sometimes it was, but not always. 
So I felt I needed to look outside of ethical culture to find mm -hmm. to find the knowledge that I was looking for. Yeah. And isn't that really our duty here on earth is to go seek and find answers and have the world make sense to us. I think it's a really a sacred an adventure. Mm -hmm. An adventure. Yeah. Life is best lived as an adventure. It's one of those like important steps in that we'll call it spiritual journey. And that is, is that we come into a format and a structure that, that gives us the knowledge we need to have, but it always has a certain point in time where we get pushed out that we need to move beyond, that that system, whether it's through a, a guru tradition or whether it's through a traditional religion or whatever, that it provides such a significant part of our lives. We don't dismiss what we learn from that, but we also have to know that there's a time to move. And, 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 and I think it's ingrained within these traditions sometimes just to push forward, to push back on you. To, so do you have self-authority? Right. And it's very hard to do because when you're part of a system, you feel that you belong, you have friends, you have, you don't yeah. have to think so much for yourself necessarily because somebody else is giving you what, what to think about. And yeah. it's really hard to, to step away from that. And I, when I left my first group, I, I, I thought I was going to die because I was like, well, who am I without them? I'm nothing. Yeah. And it was, I found out there were other pathways. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I had more strength than I thought I did. I, I appreciate our system, no belief system, no dogma, just pure experience. But um, it's also interesting that we live in an age in which everything's at our fingertips. And I often think, what would it be like, as much as I appreciate these early cultures, you would have that culture. That would be your, your playground to go exploring. But uh, one thing I appreciate about today is we have so many that we can dive into. Yeah. At least, you know, in yeah. cross reference and yeah. Yeah. And it's all accessible. So mm -hmm. there's there's joy in that. Um so well, I know that you do have a slideshow you want to you want to share with us, and that will help probably lay out the story in more detail than we can do just through pure questions. But um I think you're you yeah. know, from the day that we first met you and you told us your story, we knew that there's something significant about this. And I think well, we can all relate to this yeah. because each of us, whether we didn't have the same level of trauma in childhood as you did, we still know that sometimes we just don't fit in. We're asking questions <laughs> that can't be answered. You know, we feel like we're the black sheep of our family. We don't know because we're, we're, we're oh, you're describing our story, yeah. our story as well. And that there's a, that there's, you dare there's, to ask the questions that come from your soul. And uh, mm -hmm. much of the society doesn't appreciate that, yeah. right? It's getting yeah. better. Yeah. Right? It's getting more. Yeah. yeah. So interesting. I also I also want to say that I appreciate where your insights come up. So when we were talking with Lawson Melnori, ethno musicologist, and you talked about the awe and the, the vibration, we were talking about vibrating ourselves, our own physiology as instruments. And yeah. that is a spiritual practice as well. And the foundation of music and song and dance. Um, you mentioned the vowel sounds, the God sounds that had us intrigued. So we're going to hear more about that as well. Uh, so I have, actually I have three slideshows, and in the second one, I I, I okay, lay that okay. out a little bit more more fully. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So would you like me to do the yes, first? Yes. Go ahead and launch now? now, then. Okay. So I'll share my screen. Paige is saying there's always a cultural bias in any system. Oh, indeed. Yeah. You know, that I guess it's one of the main has, journeys. That doesn't mean that we don't have we, we, we can't question it. Right. Yeah, but I mean, right. it's really about getting outside our own blinders, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To take them off temporarily. Okay, so here's the beginning of the slideshow. And I, I put the word abracadabra at the bottom of the of the title. And the reason for that is this is actually a really, really old Hebrew magic. The word abracadabra, a B, a, a Hebrew words tend to be three letter roots. And so this B-R-A is bara, and it means to create. And those in Genesis in the Bible, when God is busy creating, that's the word that is used, bara. And for those that know Hebrew, da, da, da bar, da, uh, I can't, I'm mispronouncing it now, but deber, deber means to speak. So abracadabra literally means I create it as I say it. Mm. Uh -huh. So it's a very old magic, magic formula or magic spell because spelling is is language. Let's see. Okay, so this is this is this is where I found my first in to understanding 
some of the words that I that I look at. In English, we have our letters are are just basically sounds. The form of the letters, I, I don't know where they came from, but I don't know that they have any specific meaning. But Hebrew letters are different. They they evolved from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, which are pictures basically. And so they have they have a sound like English letters do, but they also have a meaning and they have a picture. So you can look at the letters a little bit differently than you can look at English letters. I, I, it's the the um, font that I'm going to use is called Semitic Early, and the uh, the time period of it was about 3,200 years ago. And I just want to note that these are font the fonts I'm using for this presentation come from Microsoft. They're not mine because sometimes I get challenged. Well, where did this come from? And it's like, yeah, no, I did not make this up. I promise you, these these letters are indeed the come from the ancient Hebrew, ancient, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Well, they have some shared history. So. Yeah. Yes. So this is the the first letter. We just to explore it a little bit, and it's the letter B, and I have it in modern here and in or Semitic early right here, oh. and. We pronounce it bay, base, bay, bay, or beth. And again, it's a transliter transliterated language, so it can be pronounced differently in English, but it means house. And I just want to note, because uh, I'm going to discuss this in a few minutes, this that the, the, for the modern letter, you see this little flame on the top? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hebrew alphabet is called the uh, alphabet of fire. And that's because this little flame is it, you need this little thing to make all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, all the modern letters. But for our purposes today, we're gonna to look at the letter B as it is in its ancient uh, early Semitic form. So this, so, so this is a house. And if you talk, people that study this have said that this is this front section, it's a tent structure is where the men would sit and the women would be inside here protected and cooking and caring for children. And I've always looked at this and going, yeah, that makes no sense whatsoever. It's just too narrow and it's not a, not something easily set up in a tent. But I don't, does anybody else, do you see it? Do you see the image of what this is? Yeah. This is actually the, this is the center of a labyrinth. Yes. Mm, yeah. And the labyrinth is a really important image because it's, it has a lot, a lot of meaning, meanings, but one of them is it's considered the birth control, uh, mm -hmm. birth control, birth, birth canal of the great goddess. Mm -hmm. And if we think about, we're born from our human mother. And when we come into the world, we come in through a spiral, a physical spiral, but our spirit comes in or our soul comes in through the agency of the great goddess. And it's also a spiral. Right. And then, so here I'll show you some images that kind of make this clear. So here's some really old images. And these are from the books of Marija and Gimbutas, the, her work. And here you can see a pregnant, pregnant goddess and they consider this a serpent. And here's a, this is a, a, um, a model of a, of a temple. And you can also see the spiral. So it's it's very deeply connected with goddess imagery mm -hmm. and birth imagery. So we go to another letter. This is the letter D, which is pronounced Dal or Daleth, and it means door. Notice in the modern version, we have our little flame. And in the early Semitic, we have a door and it's a tent door. So it's not a door like we go, we can, we have a solid door, we can lock it, nobody can come in. This is a tent door and a tent door moves in both directions. So this is, this is an interesting kind of door. And the next letter is Lam or Lamed and it's a shepherd's staff. And notice again, we have our flame at the top on the modern letter. And in the Semitic letter, it's it's just a shepherd's staff. And this one, this this letter tends to mean it tends to mean all things divinity. And the reason for that is that a shepherd leads his flock, and he does so with authority. And that one of the god names L, this is it's two is two letters, Aleph and Lam. And so Lam is 
is an important letter in that. It's also the largest letter written. It's, it's, it's a particularly, if you, you write them all on a line, the llama will go over the line. And I'm gonna put them together now into a word. So the word is Fidel and it's used for divided. And all throughout Genesis, God's dividing opposites, heaven and earth, light and dark, male and female. But the word Bedel is here it is here. I, I remember our Hebrew goes from right to left. So B D L. And B is 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 the labyrinth or the, the birth canal of the great goddess. So it's if we look at if we if we're born, if our spirit is born through the birth canal of the great goddess, the our earth is our home. So instead of just our particular house, this is our whole earth. So this is this is all things earthly. And then the L at the end, as I was describing, uh, Lamed is all things heavenly. And what do we have in between? A doorway yeah. that allows you passage. Yeah. Right. It's not. It's not. So we, when we think of of all this division going on, we think, bam, a door came down, and never again the twain shall meet. But that's not what the words say in, in, the, in creation, that it was a more of a yin yang. There was this door that swings in both direction that allows us to have energy that continues moving back and forth. And so we, and we see that in the world. We don't have light. It's not light one minute and dark the next minute mostly. We have dawn and we have dusk. So we have these threshold moments mm -hmm. that are created by this. And it's a two-way street, yeah. It's, and, and that's important, you know. We do, and how, and I and I always like to say when I, whenever I discuss this is how would our lives be different if this was our foundational knowledge? You know, there's so much, especially with the trans population. There's so much. Oh well, this is what a man's supposed to be, and this is what a woman's supposed to be. But what if our foundational knowledge, the foundational beliefs of our society, was that this was all fluid from the mm -hmm. beginning? Mm -hmm much more honoring of people would it be mm -hmm. and then we move on so Bedell so here's a, here's what I translate Bedell as a flowing energy that moves through the threshold as it continues to flow in both directions mm -hmm. and then okay and then here's another word and this is an important one. Oh yeah <laughs> Yud, or Y-H-V-H, and it's always, whenever you see Lord in the Bible, it's always capitalized, it's, this is what you will find if you look at the Hebrew, Y-H-V-H. It's called the Tetragrammaton, and there's no extra vowels included, so there's no, so there's, there's constant argument over how it's pronounced. So mm -hmm. some of the common ones are Yahuwah, Yahweh, 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 and Jehovah. And for those of you who like Jehovah, my apologies, but Jehovah can't, couldn't possibly be original because there was no J sound in Hebrew. So that yeah. came later, came much later. So we're going to look at this word a little more closely. We're going to look at the letters of it. So the first letter is the Yud. Now this letter is the flame that I've been talking about. It's, it's, it's on its own. And this is the, the, uh, the ancient version of it. And it, it actually means hand. And I'll tell you in a moment how we get there. So it's, it's, a, it's a fire, but it also means hand. And there is, a, there is a connection between them, which I'll show you now. Okay, here, so this is, this is a pretty common image scene. It's Akhenaten, who was a pharaoh, and his family. And whenever he's shown, there are all these, this is the sun up here. And coming down are these rays. And these rays, I, I tried to make it bigger, are always our hands. Mm -hmm. And the hands, whenever the hands come close to the nose, it's those of the ankh, to, 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 they're holding air for the family. So here, so this is, this is, the, this is the, the basis of, of the yud. It's coming from the sun and it ends in the hand. And if this letter has been called the workman of the deity. And it and it means very often it's all like the masculine energy has been used. 
which uh, you'll see also going forth. The second letter is the H, sometimes an E, because A is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and E is the fifth letter of the English alphabet. And this is our breath syllable. It means behold or breath. And here it is again, modern. We see our yud there. Now I saw yud instead of flame. And here's the, it's a little person kind of breathing. Almost, it's almost, I, I see it as joyful personally. I see it as a posture that we, that we do and we see in <laughs> petroglyphs, but there you go. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. That's what that is. But that's our, our breast syllable. And our, our final letter for this is the Vav, and that's a tent peg. So basically it anchors. It's oh. energy that anchors to the earth. So here we go. We'll look at this. So here it is. And here I, I wrote it out what we would consider backwards in English, frontwards is Y, H, V, H, or Yud, He, Vav, He. And again, to, to, to demonstrate, I just put the, the images of this workman of the deity. Now, in this word, the, uh, the, the name of a great goddess is hidden. Can you see it? <laughs> Anybody see it? <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> All right, give us a few more clues. Yeah. There it is. Eve. Okay. Oh, Remember, hey can be an E. So it's actually Eve, which is which means life or mean we means breath. So whenever you see Lord in the Bible, you know, we always uh, the image, the first image we always get is like a Charlton Heston type of, you know, an angry somebody who's who's shouting commands. What, what we're not actually? taught that Eve is a goddess, right? right. Eve. That's the first mistake. We yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And and she and and so this is considered the supernal or the masculine. This is considered the supernal female or feminine. So so whenever you see Lord in the Bible, it means male, female, or mother, father. Some some coming together of what was separated in the beginning. And then I hear here it is in Hebrew letters. The Tetragrammaton, and I just there's just two quotes I, I I really like because it's really an important uh, vibrational energy. So Fabre Dalavet, who worked with these who worked with these meanings, he was he was at the bottom of the turn of the century in the 1900s, and he wrote, "He who can rightly pronounce it causes heaven and earth to tremble, for it, it is the name which rushes through the universe." And I, I love this because I really do think it's it's the vibrational essence of this name that we can experience <laughs> divinity. Yeah. And then Hazrat United Khan. It, it sounds like wind, right? And wind is very meaningful to us too. Yeah. But go ahead. The yeah. knower of the mystery of sound knows the mystery of the whole universe. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's so it's it's this vibrational energy that we, you had mentioned at the beginning. And this 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 name embodies that vibrational energy. Hmm. And then I have okay, so creation. So the translations I've used when I do translations are mother, father, creator. I played with being dot vibration from being instead of being human, being vibration would be the the divin, divinity part of it. This would be the manifest part of it. And Rabbi Levy, uh, Yael Levy. She writes mystery, and I kind of added great mystery is how she translates it. So there are different, these altering tr translations of it. And finally, I just, okay, I'll, oh, and Eve. All right, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Eve. So Eve, Eve's name means life. And we, we know this because Moses, uh, not Moses, uh, Adam says, I named her Eve because she is the mother of all living. So her name actually means life. And there are two trees in the Garden of Eden. One is the tree of knowledge and the other is the tree of life, life. which is literally her name. And that's because it was her tree. So I, I always, another, I, as, I, as I asked before, what if this was our foundational knowledge that, that instead of sinning by eating from this tree, what if our foundational knowledge of our culture was she gave this freely as a gift 
the, the, this nourishment freely as a gift to humankind. How, how would our lives that be different? That would change everything, wouldn't it? Yeah, yes, it would. we would not be a mistake. Yeah. Or, or cursed in any way. And I want to show you because of the time and in other cultures, it was very common that, that the tree, the tree of life gave, freely gave gifts. So here's one from you know, like 1500 BCE. So three, over, about over 3000 years ago. And here's, here's the tree feeding a future Pharaoh. And then here's another one. And this was from a tomb. And this one was so 13, 1200 BCE. Uh, so that's about three, 3,000 years ago. And here's, here's the goddess and the tree freely giving these gifts. So, right, and I just wanted to, I, I put this in at the end because I just, just one more word I wanted to go over. And the reason I, I put it in, because I think it also relates very much to the work of the Institute. And this is the letter cough. Uh, let me get my mouse there, my cough, which is a hand and raish, which is a head. So if we put that together with, again, the bait, the word is bracha, which is blessings. Mm. And it, it may notice that whenever you give a blessing, accept a blessing, you almost always put your hands up. Mm -hmm. The reason is for that is the hands are very bright, bright vibrational essence. Yeah, transmitters, receivers we often experience. Yeah. Yes. So, so that that word is. I just wanted to share that because I really feel also that the work that the institute does puts us in touch with that. I know very my hands heat up when I hold the positions. Oh, I imagine yeah. others do as well. So that there's a reason for that because it's a blessing. So may all your works and all your days be filled with blessings. Fascinating, Janet. Oh my gosh. So how did you happen on to start decoding? I mean, I love etymology anyway, but I've never seen this etymology of no. looking back to the, can you tell us a little bit more of how you happened onto this and your deep study of it? Well, because I saw the shamanic lessons, uh, the teachings in there and other people did, did the work before of, of connecting these Egyptian hieroglyphs with understanding the meaning of the words. Right. Although I took it in a little bit different direction. In fact, Jeff, Jeff Benner, he is an ancient Hebrew Institute and he, he's, I don't know if he's actually working now, but he, 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 he's decoded. He did a, what does he call it? A mechanical translation of the Bible. And that means that he took each word of the Bible and always translated it the same because words in the Bible are often translated differently in different contexts. Right. So he, as so all the part of that work, yeah. So he that that was almost like a way in for me because as soon as I saw, you know, how these the, these rebuses, I'm like this is these are lessons. Every one of these is a teaching. Yes, and these original meanings um, are so I don't know full of life and heart and deep meaning. I mean, each one, as you say, is a, is a lesson. It's about the dynamics of the universe. It's about the flow of energy. It's about the engagement that, that we have with our universe and our place in it. I mean, it's beautiful. And so I, think I a was- A lot of these lessons, they, they, were, they tried to hide them. You know, the scribes or the, the, the priests of the time tried to hide them because it was a turnover from a patriarchal, a pa from a, well, not a matriarchal, but a, but a, a pagan way of looking at the world to a patriarchal way of looking at the world. And, and I, and I feel like these clues were left behind, like they couldn't quite hide it totally. Well, also maybe in the march towards civilization and the unfoldment of our history, um, it's interesting how we adapt, we merge, we make use of what's there, make it adaptable for our time and our situation with each culture. And I was just reading how AI uh, is now employed to decode the cuneiform, the cuneiform scripts oh, wow. and how there's a million cuneiform scripts, but nobody's, it's, you, scholars have to study so deeply to even do so. And how it was really about going from Sumerian to the Akkadian. And so you have to transliterate twice 
what did the symbol mean in terms of the letters and now you're putting the letters together and what is that new meaning and so it's very cumbersome to do so so i would imagine that would also uh, be a reason why so much gets lost along the way and how familiar people are with it so it seems to be a shorthand everybody knows except the succeeding generations that don't grow up so it's it's just hard to transmit knowledge through time i would i would say as well Especially if there's an agenda <laughs> yeah, well and political upheaval and cultural and merging cool. and you know so much social and uh and political and and change in all in all ways so but it's fascinating to go back to this and um so take some questions like i, I just i feel like this is very new so sometimes yeah. people have questions of like Sure. Know, what is this? What are you doing? So I don't know. There any and this is just questions? one piece of what she's going to present today. So yeah, well, let's start right here with saying you can raise your hand, you know, on the Zoom screen, it has the reactions button. You can raise your hand and ask questions or make a comment about what you're listening and to. And then we'll also look at how you're vocalizing it, how yeah. you're embodying. I that's, mean, yeah, we're that's, my next, body that's my next yeah. that's so, my next slideshow. <laughs> that's the next slideshow. Good. Yeah. That will be fun. Yeah. The questions at this point. Uh, Miriam is saying Hebrew, like Sanskrit, is a mantric language. How do you mean, Miriam, mantric language? Mantric for me means vibrational. Yeah. That is the power syllables. Hi, Miriam. Hi. So I'm far from a Hebrew scholar or anything even close to being far from it. But um, it's each sound as the specific vibration as opposed to english where it's just all kind of thrown together so each word if you're using words where each sound or syllable as a vibration it makes the language sacred and holy and creative as opposed to just blah 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 <laughs> yes yeah it is good yeah, yeah. thank well, you well stated thank you <laughs> Yeah. And uh, pages or Lee is saying, I think these ancient people used mythology to actually share science. I think so too. I think symbols have so much meaning and how do we convey new ideas? How do we look at what's new other than using the tools that we have at present and using them in new ways? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And Lee's, also Lee's also asking, how is the Jewish community responding to your writings? Ah, I keep not asking. well. <laughs> <laughs> occasionally i'll get some of it's like yeah it's like oh wow <laughs> well we've always been about trying on new ideas right making up our own minds yeah, yeah. So, exactly so talk talk about the mantra is sounding them we tone we we sing we vocalize well, should i do the next, the next slide show because that one that's one where i really yeah. good okay so sacred sound and vibration oh very good Okay, and then these so these are called power syllables or seed syllables. And you know, if you try saying them out loud, you can feel the vibrations. Al, la, el, hu, ya, lo, ha, a. And the reason that they're seed syllables is they carry that vibrational essence that's very powerful and sets up a a vibration in our own bodies. And I, again, I, I don't know if it's all uh, names for divinity, but certainly a vast majority of them use these different seed syllables for names of God or names and of like divinity. Om and and others, you know. Right, Om, om would be one, but yeah. like Allah, mm -hmm. Al isn't all by itself a, a God name. Mm -hmm. uh, Yahoo, Ah. Uh, is one of the tetragrammaton, tetragrammaton ways. Well, of, even in Hawaiian, who is a common syllable, right? And who many is people. worldwide. Yeah. Syllable, yes. And it's and and even alahuya, which is the uh, seed, so which are the syllables of hallelujah. Ah. That come out of these, and it basically means praise Yah, Yah being a shorthand for the tetragrammaton. And, and uh, as somebody pointed out, aloha, because, you know, Hawaiian is a very gentle, loving language, and it's very much in touch with the thresholds, with the other sides. 
Oh yeah. And so, you know, so the, their greeting is, is just that very gentle, beautiful way of expression. Hmm. Okay, and then I'm, we're gonna look, we're gonna look at who, because that is such a universe. They're all universal, but who is kind of special. So th this is how I came to understand this is, so there's this, the, uh, quotes like this are very common where they're praising the name of the Lord. For this name alone is excellent. That's one of the Psalms. And that's, and I, it bo always bothered me because I was like, wait a second. Why is this, what does this mean? This name is so special. It's like saying to you, Laura, well, you have such a great name. You must be very wise. Yeah. Or Paul, you have such a great name. You must be wise. <laughs> Like, and I was like, that makes no sense at all. But it does make sense if we understand that the, these names are what we looked at in the first slideshow, yod Hey vav Hey, mm -hmm. is a name that has this vibrational essence that we can, we can resonate with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so who- so You're even decoding them experientially, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So who is a very important one. It's one, it was one of the names of the Sphinx in Egypt. There was an Egyptian deity, Tehuti. The Mayans had their only god, Hunabku. Uh -huh. And then we can go to Mesoamerica, Huehuecotl, or Huehuecotl with the hu sound. In Tibet, they would say hu hu. Uh, hu is the, from, from Celtic, and hu, it became the name H-U-G-H. Ahura Mazda in Zoroastrian. And the Aramaic name for Jesus is Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And oh, you know, again, as I said, there's no general agreement of the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, but my favorite is Yahuwah. And maybe and that's we, why we assign Al's wisdom because they're always saying who, aren't they? Interesting. Good one. I like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But also, it's, 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 it, if we think about what we are, we are human beings oh, so we, what our name is is actually recognition of the divinity of all people beautiful hmm. Hmm. that we are all children of the great goddess come to earth as our home <laughs> and then so abraham abulafia he was a mystic from the 1200s and he was uh known as the founder of prophetic Kabbal kabbalism and he created this chant which is a wonderful wonderful chant and he uses the holy name the yod hey vav hey and he created a chanting protocol called seraph mm -hmm. and seraph means alchemy which is a form of transformation so here is his chant oh See, we're gonna hear it 1200s. okay <laughs> yeah so he, and i just put this picture on because the bird has its uh i gotta move the picture the bird has his mouth open he's chanting yes yes yeah. So what he did is he made each letter and then uh, used vowel sounds after each letter of the holy name. So Yahavaha, Yay Hey Vey Hey, Yi He Vi He, Yo Ho Vo Ho, and You Hu Vu Hu, and. The way he did it, though, was he would have the, his students chant this first one until he felt that they had chanted it enough. Okay. And then, and then they would go on and chant the second one. But the way I've experimented with it in some of my groups is to, to do a round with it. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, and it, I don't know if one is more powerful than the other. It, it, these are such powerful syllables. And it's it's a wonderful practice. If anybody is 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 given to doing chanting, I highly recommend it as a Absolutely. as a practice. What do you think the mechanics are? Because you're you're exercising through all the different possible vowel sounds, and so you're activating it in all facets. Or um, is it something that? I mean, what do you? Why do you think it works? In your experience, I think, I think knowledge is held in vibration. Mm -hmm. And when we when we hold when we chant out these different vibrations, different knowledge can come to us, or can move through us. Now we're we tuning to various frequencies, and therefore there's a conduit that's 
activated in a sense? We may not even know consciously, but our body knows because it's a vibrational essence that moves through our physical being. Yeah. Hmm. And they say that if you chant, so different chants can can just just like different different poses, different mm-hmm. chants can connect you to different energies and or different knowledge. Ah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in the sense of a posture, we think of it like an antenna. We're bending different different ways, but it's tuning to a frequency. Yes. I mean, I I read once where Leonardo da Vinci would sit in a church under the window that colored purple he felt purple was or violet was a particular frequency that he wanted to absorb so practicing color therapy for example Mm -hmm. uh, through their their multicolored um, windows so here's another uh, aspect of activating all different any different direction sound color positioning yeah Yeah. many ways of tuning to various frequencies and then what they yeah and I, Lee points out that in Chinese medicine, the, these sounds that she's seeing you share, they're really used to clear stagnant um, energies from the organs and bring them back into optimum balance. So no, just, Lee, you have to, yeah. That's an interesting yes. one. have yeah. to go to you in just a bit, yeah. And Jean is saying Sanskrit and Hebrew chanting actually change uh, changes body shape from her experience. Wow. Oh, interesting. Wow. And then I had finally I have this quote from again Hazrat Yanai Khan and sorry for these dots I couldn't really get rid of them but but he was a, a Sufi mystic and he wrote this breath runs through all three body mind and soul seeing from this point of view one will realize that man has never been separated from God that with every breath man touches God he is linked with God by the current of breath mm-hmm. and with apologies to Khan. Because Khan was a, a preacher of his own time period. I've changed out humanity for man and Yahuwah for God. And I think it gives it a, a different vibration. So I'm going to reread it. It says, breath runs through all three, body, mind, and soul. Seeing from this point of view, one will realize that humanity has never been separated from Yahuwah. And that with every breath, humanity touches Yahuwah. Humanity is intertwined with Yahuwah through the current of breath. Ah, beautifully adapted. Yeah, and that is a lesson that we also see bubbling up through any practice, I think, that that goes beyond, mm. right? That transcends our, our blinders. Is that how connected we are, how the universe is breathing through us, how we are its instruments, mm-hmm. how, uh, yeah, all of life is sacred. It's so beautiful to see the various traditions express the same thing over and over and over again, right? It just gives us such hope for the for the world and future. The possibilities. Yeah. The possibilities are endless. Yeah. And it seems like no matter where we go, when you go to the ends of the ends of the earth, you find the same lessons. I even appreciate that modern physics is now finding the same thing, right? We're all connected. Energy is a substratum. So, yeah. well, beautiful, Janet. So, you know, what I find is that in your shamanic journey, viewing through the shamanic lens of what you do, you're finding the interconnectedness of all things. We find that too, that it's really about one world in all of its diversity and all of its vibration, one beautiful tapestry. So how could, how could, how could the modern Hebrew scholars quibble with that, isn't it? Aren't you saying something beautiful about that? that my take. Tradition? Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm trying yeah. to tell you what you have is sacred. You're so fortunate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Lee's also saying about Qigong, they believe that the violet energy, it composes the entire universe and is the most healing vibe. Lee, you have to turn on your microphone. Oh. Share more, share more of your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. again, we're finding, yeah, universal knowledge here. Uh, so, well, it may, it may take her a moment because she's down in the Amazon. Oh, yeah. She's in Peru. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, so what do you find by delving into this? It must be personally rewarding, isn't it? Because well, even, well, and, and I'm going to talk to Brian Swim about this. Right. When you are deconstructing the the universe and looking at what physics and uh, what his cosmology is telling you 
when you look at its essence, it's saying something about the universe and our place in it and the universe as a whole and that we are part of it. I mean, I'm finding these lessons from every sector. We, I think, I think, and then I find hope with Kiara's, um, he's going to talk to us next week about this. What the further that we go with knowledge, the more that we find that it's one whole and that we're singing the same song. We're part of the symphony singing the same song. And that is so beautiful, right? That's where we can all come together in peace. That was part of, that was, that's been so important for my own healing because yeah. the more I felt connected to other people, to the universe, to the breath, to divinity, the more I've been able to feel whole for myself. And to find that maybe our early ancestors all around the world were also uh, twigging onto this as well, mm -hmm. right? They were all grokking this together. And so, yeah, they this seems to so be our much. baseline and it seems to be where we began and maybe hopefully where we'll end up again. Mm -hmm. So I, I find so much. The power of resonance, the power of sound, that reconnecting to who we are in our relationship to, to the planet, to the world, to the universe that surrounds yeah. us. It makes sense that we'd be able to draw on that and that we've yeah. lost something when we don't do that. They're the, that's why people find this, like, I got to, you know, what is this chanting? And I want to go buy an album of the Gorian Trance. <laughs> why? You know, what is it, the sounds that I'm looking for? Well, and what brings us back to the work that we do again and again is that this yeah. is the lesson that emerges. This is the insight that comes forward and written in so many different ways, mm -hmm. but it's all expressing something. And if this is our universe and this is our universal message, I feel like I'm home, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how beautiful. So- um, and you have a you have a third side show, did you say? I do. Would you like to see that one? Absolutely. Yeah. But Lee, if you're going to turn on your microphone and comment, oh, you've oh, made some interesting comments. Do it she, now. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if she can do it or she, she, she gotcha. can she will. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm just I'm hiding. Oh, there you are. <laughs> oh, okay. We thought you had some <laughs> pertinent comments there. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully. Yeah. No, oh, I'm just blown away by this presentation. Uh, do you want yeah. to comment on Qigong? And um... yeah, so I've been studying a little bit with Mantak Chia and. Oh, he froze. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I think he's got images of like violet light streaming into the body. And I was just like, wow, Leonardo da Vinci. Like, yeah, it's. Um... And then the Qigong, I would have to like re listen to my classes with him, but definitely somewhere in those vowels where you did the ya and the yi and the ye. Um, for certain organs, like who I know for sure is one of them. Um, I'll have to listen and then like get back to you. Okay. But it, it these, these sounds, so you would do them say in the morning or before going to bed um, and consciously focus on an organ combined with a color to, to mm -hmm. just remove all the stagnant energy and the energy that doesn't belong to that organ. And you know, in Chinese medicine, like, for example, the heart is like the, the queen of all the organs that, you know, has all the organs going. In Qigong, we have these different fires. There's the heart fire. There's the Dantian fire, the kidney fire. There's this whole thing about fire and, you know, fire being sacred and being our metabolism. So there's so many levels to these, these concepts. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, I'm really exciting. We want right. you to report from Peru at one of these yeah. one of these days when you're ready. Yeah. She's also part of our advanced community. And so we we had these kind of discussions on Wednesdays as well. And yeah, and, uh, oh, it's yeah. been fun. Oh, yeah. But so the fire within, and look at the mitochondria in our in our Golgi apparatus in our cells, they're little furnaces, right? And what are they tuned to? But but this cosmic energy to fire them up from yeah, the sun. Change, we can change our cellular systems. They think yeah. about our bodies, say, they say it replenishes every seven years and our cells replenish in a matter of days. So we can actually change yeah. the energy of them from yeah. the, these practices. And how we want to consciously tune into that. You know, and uh, the founder of this institute, Dr. Good, Felicitas Goodman, would always say, you can take all the knowledge of the world away and we will still arrive at this point. Why? Because all of this is built into our DNA. This is literally our heritage, the, the physiology that we've been given, how we relate to the world. It's all programmed within right. us to discover story. this again and again and again. Right. And this is how the universe is constructed. 
we are part and parcel. We are a hologram. We are a, one little facet of the whole and it's all within us yeah. and every piece of us. Yeah. Oh the, my gosh. The reverse would happen. Yeah. Yeah. How beautiful. What's your next slideshow? Let's continue. Okay. Share it. You're doing great, Janet, by the way. <laughs> well, she's got great material to work I know. With. Yeah. Oh, I like this. Okay. So, uh, what do I have? Miss Magic in the Bible, a peek be behind the veils. And I took one of my inspirations was Dr. Goodman. And this oh, is a yay. quote from her book. Yes. A myth is a report about events that took place in other reality that involve people or beings who straddle two dimensions. So we're going to look at how that can show up. Oh, where's my... Okay, so we're going to take a little detour, and I'm going to start with seeds. The okay. seeds are so incredibly important in the understanding of life, in the, in the cycles of life, in, in understanding spirituality. And in fact, Persephone, if, if you may remember the mythic story of Persephone, she has to spend time in the underworld because she ate the pomegranate seeds. So right. seeds are the foundational. It's the way life is, is sent out into the world. It's the way life is carried. And here's a whole bunch of different ways it's carried. It's, so this, this is, um, I had a, this picture earlier. It's a picture of lava. And it's really only a few months old. Yeah. And already the life. seeds found, found their purchase. Life <laughs> finds a way. Yes. And here's here's it's a seed spreading by wind. Here's seed spreading by water. Here's seed finding a crack in the pavement. Mm -hmm. uh, here's seeds uh, traveling on, on, a, on a host. Uh, here's uh, just other ways seeds. And here's uh, the seed. Uh, okay, so seeds here, they, the bird eats the, the berry. It yeah. flies away. It deposits the seed and it's, and it's in poop. And so it has its own little fertilizer uh, mound. <laughs> And it's an airlift system. It's own airlift, reverse. yes. Yeah. And, and squirrels and chipmunks, they, they'll often take seeds and follow that same process, but sometimes they'll they'll forget about it and they'll have traveled sent a seed someplace else into the ground. And this is how these is how this is how life is spread on earth. Yeah, the seeds have their own little farmer of the squirrels bearing them for their cash. Yeah. And this one has uh, its own helicopter wings, right? Uh -huh. yes. These other yeah, seeds. There's, there's just so many. And here, these are seeds that develop legs. <laughs> God, ants like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think also about, and to me, this is crucial also for Adam and Eve, because mm -hmm. they eat the seeds of the tree and um, then go out into the world. And like it's, they had, because the seeds had to leave Eden for life to exist. Yeah. So that was- and think about the was, pomegranate also as a symbol because it's multiple seeds, yes. right? Yeah. So, and we need, we need these seeds. So this, I just quoted this because it's just, it's, it's, it's so poetic to me, but it's the, it's the seed is, 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 is the be all and end all the alpha and the omega. It, it, it's, it's the root, it's the plant, it's the beginning of the plant because the seed will grow from the roots will come out, the, the, the shoot will come out into the sun. And we need, we need, the, this is, this is the process of how seeds and each seed carries the whole genetic history of its of its type within a little tiny package, <laughs> and yet it, it 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 gives us gives us endless varieties of life. And and a seed is the beginning of the plant, and it's the end of the plant because when the plant dies, it sends out seeds. And at one point, this was recognized in the Bible, although the seeds were greatly diminished, which I'll show you. So in Genesis, God said. Let the earth bring forth grass and her herb yielding seed and whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And so it was. So the seed was important even in biblical times, even though they, they downplayed it. And then here's a few more quotes. You can just look at, uh, I love this one in Arabic, hub means love and hob means seed. And there's the alpha and omega concept. It's the beginning and the end because it's the beginning of the plant and the end of the plant. Mm -hmm. And it's this whole world. I love this quote too. The whole world unfolding itself is condensed into a seed. I also like the fact that it's nature recycling, birth, death, and the promise of rebirth. It's just cycle after cycle. And that these are codes of life. 
mm -hmm. and how precious they are. And this was the teachings of the ancient mystery schools, the Greek mystery schools, and were likely Egyptian mystery schools. And of course, the mystery schools are based on Persephone's life, at least the Greek mystery schools are. So that was one of the reasons I titled my book, <laughs> Desperately <laughs> Seeking Persephone. But to go on to this, this thread, so and so Samaria got Samaria, Samaria was next, basically next to ancient Israel. And the God, the God of creation was called Enki or Ea, some just interchangeable, but he was known as the God of seeds. And in this, this uh, Sumerian passage, he's referring to himself. And it's, I brought the craftsmanship of, to my Apsu of Eridu. I am the true seed emitted by a great wild bull. I make abundance perfect. Oh, wow. These so, are very ecstatic, these old hymns and this poetry, so isn't it? They are. So, Ea, so the Sumerian Noah was called Utnapishtim. And it was Ea, Ea or Enki, who was the god of seeds and the great wild bull who went to, to Utpatmishim and said the following, because there was a flood coming, throw aside your possessions and preserve life, bring into the ship seed of all living things. Hmm. So they collected the seeds so that they could to preserve life on earth. And he was given this task, Utnapishtim was given this task by the bull god. So we can take this now to the Bible. So Noah was also instructed to build an ark in Genesis. And the name of God used in this, in this passage is Elohim, which is a variation of the God name El. And he's actually a great bull, bull god as well, because here he is in the ancient, the early Semitic pictographs. And really, I should say they, because Elohim is plural. So it could either, be, it could also be the cow goddess. But if you notice Aleph and Lam, we've already seen Lam. And this is just another uh, version, another font that I, I put it in. I like this, I guess, because you can see the, the cow or bull head. But if you see, this is the bull head. Uh, which became the letter A through time. It became Aleph, the letter A, or one of the letter A's. So that's the name of L. So a bull god also came to Noah to make his ark for the, for the flood. So notice, so he, he's given this instruction, and the instruction is to keep seed alive on the face of the earth. Mm. So it's very unlikely, if you think about it, that he actually brought two of every animal onto an ark and had to take care of him. It's far more likely that like his Sumerian counterpart, Utpat, Utpatmishtim, that he actually brought seeds onto his ark. Much more portable. Ark. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> more portable, yes. So it's yeah. very unlikely that, uh, so, they, so, so, it, so yeah, I just basically say, if they, if they were both given their mandates to collect seeds onto a ship or ark, by a similar bold divinity, it would be logical con to conclude that both were off offshoots of the same original story. In this case, Noah would have originally been a protector of seeds, not living animals in his ark. And metaphysical author Rene Guinan uh, describes the contents of Noah's arks as the elements which will serve for the restoration of the world after the flood. And you're talking about a metaphorical ark? I mean, we know floods. Yeah, I mean, happened. was it a real arc? I mean, there, that's where that's where you straddle the worlds, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. So it's a Does it matter whether it was a real arc or a metaphorical or a mythic? Yeah. It's part of our story. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little detour, but I promise this will make sense if you hang in there. So thresholds are places of transformations, and they have a long storied history. In the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's transported to Oz through a tornado. Alice falls down a rabbit hole in the Nutcracker Ballet. Clara enters her magical uh, world through a dream. And it's thresholds that call, it, call us to adventure. Oh, well, we always say that Joseph Campbell talks about crossing the magical threshold into yep. what we call the alternate reality or exactly. off on your hero journey. So yes, it's, thresholds are important. They take us out of our mundane reality and, and call us to adventure. And ultimately, I believe a greater understanding of ourselves and our lives. Indeed. Yeah. So, and ancient Egypt was a land of thresholds. They really 
got deeply into the concept of thresholds. So this is a very frequent type of papyrus that you would find in, or image that you would find in Egypt. And notice all the boundaries and edges. So you have water to land. You have, you have uh, so you have both reeds and papyrus, which grow right at the, at the marshlands between water and land. You have birds, which are the, 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 the threshold between land and air. So they'd have, so threshold images were really one of their major um, focuses that you see very often in, in, in images from the time. Okay, so now we're gonna go, go, to, go, go to one of the mythic stories and this is Moses. So he was put into a reed basket when he was a baby and he was put into the reeds and reeds, as, reeds are the symbol of thresholds in Egypt. So he was put into reeds at the banks of the Nile and the word is suf. So, he, so the, the basket, they use the word gome for the papyrus they used to make the basket and the reeds that he was put into is called suf along the banks of the Nile. Okay, but the word suf is translated 12 times in the King James Bible as threshold rather than as reeds, because again, reeds and thresholds are, are interchangeable in, in, in the culture. So the threshold was literally a doorway. So again, it could be actual symbolic mythic, but it's a boundary uh, where heaven and earth or divine and earth meet. It's a doorway. And I put this quote up of, uh, from Isaiah just to show one of the times that it was used as threshold. Okay, so now we're going to, back to Moses. And if you remember Moses, there was an injunction that all the Hebrew babies, uh, male babies were to be killed. So his mother, when she could no longer hide him, she didn't want to kill him. She made him an ark of bulrushes. And the ark is called a taba. And this is an, a Persian image. And this, this is supposed to be his ark and where he's sent down into the Nile. And the word, the word taba, which is what used for Moses, is only used 28 times in the Bible. It's used at one time for, for, for Moses, for, for Moses, but the other 27 times it's used in the story of Noah. <laughs> so what do we what what do we make of all of that? If if the ark carries the seeds, so who is Moses? And I just discussed this here. So Moses himself, as a mythic, he was a, he was one of these figures that transcended the threshold. And and Mark Klein, I, I took this. Uh, this was from a book called Serpent Skin. He describes how there are really so many other words they could have used. They could have used casket or basket or ship or boat, but they used the word taba because it was the special ark that carried seeds. So suf means whirlwind in Hebrew, and it was a whirlwind that took Dorothy on her, her journey between Kansas and Oz. So there's the, it's entered the mythos of our, of our present day world. Now, this is what so, I find so interesting. The Hebrew name for the Red Sea is Yam Suf. And I have no idea why, ever why it became a Red Sea. I've, I've never seen an explanation that makes sense. Ah. Somehow Yam Suf was translated into Greek and then it got translated into English and it became Red Sea. But again, I've never found, I've never heard an explanation that mean, makes sense. So Yam Suf could be sea of reeds, but it could also be a threshold, the sea of thresholds. And it would make sense that Moses would be the person to take a community through thresholds because he had already taken this journey when he was a baby. Hmm. So when he parted the waters, perhaps he was just creating a gateway, a doorway to other realms. That this was a journey. And we know that a new religion was founded as part of this journey. So we know it was a spiritual journey. Interesting. So I'll go back to Dr. Goodman's quote. <laughs> a, myth, a myth is a report about events that took place in the other reality that involved people or beings who straddled the two dimensions. Mm -hmm. 
So you are suggesting that there is some deep shamanic traditions behind all of these myths that mm. are are here in the Old Testament. And mystery school. Mystery school. Traditions. Mystery school. Yeah. But that that would make sense because all of those Mesopotamian religions that go so far back in time. Yeah. And that we, I mean, yeah, Janet, thank you. It's like <laughs> it takes a while for your brain to go, <laughs> you know, and filter through this. And like, what are the implications here? And that's what the mystery schools did. They took people through initiations of thresholds. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I'm also interested. And that crossing the threshold is how you get from one realm to the other. And that it is a doorway. It's a flap between two, two tents. You exactly. can passage yes. frequently forward and backwards. Mm. Yes. Go ahead. Mm. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that. Yeah. And, and Jen, I'm just so interested in how the scholarship and research that you've done to help maybe for resolution within yourself. You, you're driven you have a, 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 an appetite to, to has to be satisfied. And so you've done all this work and all this, this ways of trying to understand and put it in perspective. And the fact that you're taking the traditions using the Bible, using religion, using the uh, um, sound, uh, all these different phenomena and bringing it together in a way, basically for self-resolution, for your, your own satisfaction to be able to continue your journey next. <laughs> but I think also what the what our culture needs to resolve, yeah. right? I, 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 yeah. To find peace with the past, peace with the present, and see a way forward. Rather for the than future. putting our heads in the sand, coming yeah. out and saying, "What's it going to take for me to figure?" And this? I hope I'm, I'm I'm showing the pathway to new paradigms because the paradigms yes. we have aren't working. If anybody's noticed, right. they're world. all broken. That, that with new paradigms, or maybe really old paradigms, we can find new pathways to yeah. negotiate this this treacherous land we're in and figure out new ways of, of doing this work. Yeah. Well, you described your own childhood as broken, but I think we're all broken, right? Mm -hmm. We've broken with our past. We are confused and, you know, the shifting sands beneath us of our own culture, our mythology, our cosmology. It's just all in motion here. And we need to find some solid ground and a way forward. And how better than to look to the universals and to find it in our history and to say it is, it is part if we of our- fill, if, our, if yeah. we fill ourselves up with enough distraction, where we can live in a world of denial and continue living that world of denial until finally something collapses. And what Janet's talking about today is, is that if you're yeah. one of those people that are willing to get past that, that, that threshold of denial and, and, and self- self-distraction or take off the blinders and that's, that's the, the call thing. that's the call to adventure you know we could we yeah. could, uh, yeah, that's we could Joseph Campbell. you know alice fell down the rabbit hole covid could de 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 descend upon the earth so all kinds of things in our lives send us into this nether world of thresholds where we need to find Very new common. ways to, to be well, I yeah, want to get some other call is from deep within. I just want to read Lee's um, comment. Love, okay. She says that um, boundaries and edges in permaculture, it's considered the most productive agricultural space or wild growing spaces. And she says, I bet the edges and boundaries are the most productive creative spaces for energetic spiritual growth Absolutely. and transformation as well above. Very, very nice up. analogy. Yes. Well but you know, those boundary yeah. lines are where we have to negotiate passage mm -hmm. right where the ground changes beneath us and we need to we need to draw from within to to mm -hmm. navigate that so and i want to invite Jude some saying as the edges of islands go ahead sorry i was just going to invite some of the voices Please? to join us yeah and uh, i was going to start out with brian tucker because brian's been working with laura and i in in, mm -hmm. in a dedicated program of of trying to integrate this kind of conversation into this concept of global consciousness. What is happening in the world around us? And what is those things that create that shift, that momentum, that that pinnacle where um, this this so-called so planetary healing, this, this idea that we can have a shared vision together uh, as humanity can uh, reveal itself. So uh, Brian, I'm gonna throw you on yeah. here. <laughs> okay, I'll just comment briefly. Janet, I'm really fascinated with your presentation. Um, I get the sense that for you, it might have started as a seed, perhaps a seed of intuition, that you could intuit there, there's more to these stories, it's like an archaeologist, um, and that your kind of curiosity and your tenacity has allowed you to uncover 
kind of it's your own midrash it's it's your interpretation but in judaism we're all given the ability to have midrash and commentary on the torah it's not one hierarchical only interpretation um and so it's a very compelling midrash and it opens the door to a more profound way i guess experiencing what is the nature the sacredness the odd nature um i love the idea of eve uh, being a symbol of life uh, originally. And also, I just wanted to share, I've been experimenting at this time of the season, growing from seeds into small containers of soil. And it's utterly fascinating the way a seed puts down a radix, uh, a root and a, a sprout in orients to the light. So in the same way, I feel like, um, you know, maybe that's its own, if we could examine the miraculous intelligence, the knowledge within nature, that took an incredible amount of evolutionary journey, you know, 4 billion years for a seed to understand, a plant to understand how to pass on its progeny. Um, so I'm really optimistic your approach is awakening maybe a reclamation of these more ancient ways of knowing in a more, as you say, a new paradigm. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of Thank excited. You. Well said. Further. Yeah. I love that Thank miraculous you. knowledge or wisdom of the seed and life and nature. Beautiful. Yeah. Brian, Thank I you. know that you tie a lot of spiritual traditions together. And so do you want to comment on the universality of some of these insights and, and bedrock? That we're discussing? Well, I, I'm fascinated. Again, I feel like it's an intuitive journey when when senses like you have done, Janet, that you're you're sensing these commonalities. In fact, as you were talking about the chants, I started remembering when I've heard in a Sufi zikr, you know, some of these phrases were who and Yahoo, they're very prominently spoken and, and they, these threads show up uh, for some, you know, maybe there is a language uh, that's yet to be uncovered. And that's, I'm fascinated with the work of Felicitas Goodman and the Institute. Maybe there is some more universal language of trance experience that will help us navigate forward, so. Said, and could you define midrash? What is a midrash for those of us who? Um, oh, midrash, as I understand it, uh, you know, interpretations from Torah. Uh, one of the things is that the words were written down without the use of vowel sounds. So, you know, Hebrew letters they can be viewed on multiple levels and multiple interpretations. So, midrash, I have understood it to mean an interpretation. And so we're all given this ability to read these sacred texts and hear from these stories what has truth and meaning for us. It's not only the rabbi. It's an additionally, we each have a voice to add and offer. Ah, and, you know, you, each of these founders of religions were about finding their own way, right? Finding some new path. And so I would think that it's really incumbent on each of us to find our own path. Mm, yes. uh, in, in the greater context. You know, maybe that's yeah. the reason why there's a necessity for mystery schools because it has to be a container. It's not necessarily trying to keep the masses away from knowledge. It's just that the masses are not at that point of understanding of, of desiring it. And it's like, we don't have to share this and throw this out there onto the table until there's a desire that is a community of people around it and we have to hold space. So let's well, create a safe container for each of container. us to find our way, use right. our intuition, right. Right. use right. our inner promptings, yeah. Yeah. right? We're each on our own hero's journey. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Hey, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Insights. Yeah. Yeah. And if any, anyone else, raise your hands and uh, okay. ask questions. Okay. Yeah, we got Okay, yeah. Paige, did you want to ask a question or comment? Yeah, on yeah uh, I, I'd like to ask Janet if she could comment on um, how her work sheds light on the transition from a goddess-centered uh, culture to a patriarchal one. <laughs> That's a good wow. Just a little question. <laughs> That's a small question. question. Know, <laughs> Ten words or less. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, th I think... So I actually similar to what Brian said, one of one of the ways I call my work is spiritual forensics. Mm. Just like going back. And mm -hmm. and I do think when the when patriarchy took greater hold, and so I think I saw somebody wrote, wrote some of the knowledge was forgotten. But I think some of it was consciously hidden. Mm. Because yeah. because in a in a in a society where everybody has their own authority, and authority, by the way, comes from is, is the same root as the word author. 
so everybody can author their own lives yeah, yeah. patriarchy can't take hold mm. yeah because people wouldn't accept it right. because it's an authoritarian top down and and goddess religions i think are more internal and i, and I actually think it's not just goddess it's god goddess religions because mm -hmm. i think the male and female needed to be balanced it was it was a more internal system and once it became patriarchy the 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 vision that we had was a top down type of society mm. but of, why would you why would you even bother to write down these stories if you were if you were trying to hide something i mean why well, bought one, you one, was, one, way, one way was to reverse them oh uh to cast but, I also, but I also think like stories that stand the test of time have many layers of meaning and as i oh. pointed out in, in midrash they, they, there's so many ways they could be viewed and one isn't right and one isn't wrong there's just different ways of looking at them. There, there's so many layers of meaning that you can go delve deep into each one of these stories and find different lessons or te and teachings. Mm -hmm. well, also, how does it serve your current purpose to take what's there and then to put your own, cast your own, your own mm -hmm. take on it is what it seems to me. I mean, you looked at Ed and Hedwana and her story is so fascinating yeah. about here, her father was the big conqueror and she was tasked with, let's bring these two communities together, the conquered and the conquerors, and let's find some peace. And we need to cast some new stories. And uh, reading about her, yeah, she was, her, her words, she was the first one to put her own stamp on, here are my words, here's some new hymns, here's what we need to find peace. And they were copied and retold for centuries after her. And uh, I also think she was her father's daughter. It's like, it's yes, the they sent the missionaries into the indigenous people as the soft to soften the ground for, 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 for bringing patriarchy to the indigenous people as well. Yeah. I kind of think she was she was a ground softener. Yeah. And and here we are enjoying the fruits of advanced civilization, but there were these transition moments. Goodman would say that from these um shamanic tribes having this deep relationship with the beyond, with the ancestors, with the spirits, with this whole womb of creation of which this universe seems to be and what it gives us that in order to have the city states, mm -hmm. the kingship, the priest, oh, you can only go through through there through me right, now, right. the farmers, the, um, the craftsmen, the builders, the military to protect it all, you had to, the stratification. what we lost when you stratified society, right. and now people had roles. And now the threshold, talk about a threshold with the priesthood, oh, you can only get there through me. You can't go there direct. Exactly, yes. Huge change. You wanna to talk to God? Huge change. Over here, people. Yeah, <laughs> this is yeah. forbidden turf now. That's yeah. by the way, what 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 my one of my teachers had the theory that that's why Hebrew letters Hebrew words were written without vowels because the vowel sounds are the transitional sounds, the God sounds as you put them, the uh -huh. activation sounds, so God breaking us yeah. into a frequency sounds. Yeah, so we have hands yeah. up. I'm going to go yeah. back to Lee for a moment. Then we're going to go to John Berger. If you have a question or comment, put your hand up. Turn on your video so I can see you. And uh, we'll put you up afterwards. Okay, Lee, you're up again. Here you are. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to ask, just so that I have a better understanding, what is your definition of warrior shamanism and adventure shamanism? Good question. <laughs> I actually go quite, I go quite through it quite in detail in my book because I write about my initiations and trainings. But here's what I think would be the main way that I look at it. Warrior, it's how they look at death. In warrior shamanism, it's everything's training you to be a warrior, so to face death. So we would do practices all the time. We would write our own obituaries and we would be buried. We, we, would, we would study the Spartans. We saw the last samurai movie by with Tom Cruise in it. Every, everything, and the idea was to, to how do you face death and not be afraid? Hmm. And that, that was the whole focus. They said, the, we all fear the unknown and the greatest unknown is death. So that mm -hmm. was the entire focus of, of everything that we studied. And I did that for 17 years. Wow. Okay. In adventure shamanism, with, or, or in uh, Serge's way of looking at it, death is simply another adventure. 
And if life is an adventure, so too is death. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. That makes thank sense. You. Celebrating life, right? You're celebrating the More adventure. Of a celebration. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Focused on that. Yeah. Yes. And Serge will come on. He's agreed to come and join us in this forum. Right. We just have to find we, a date. And we have a podcast yeah. already pro posted. Oh, yeah. We so so dying would be another transition, another yes. threshold. Well, sure threshold. In, mm -hmm. in that adventure. Uh, yeah, we come, we come to the come to life through the through the birth canal of the great goddess. We mm -hmm. we we go the other direction as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Back to the goddess. What else, Lee? Anything else? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I think she that was her. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead. Laura. Yeah. No. Oh, it's there's like smoke coming out of my ears. Um, <laughs> there is a an indigenous um, group called the Quiero that live in the Andes Mountains that for 500 years, um, pretty much everyone on the planet thought they went extinct mm -hmm. um, because when the Spanish came, they realized we're not gonna be able to defend ourselves. Like they realized, no, no, no. Uh, the only way to save ourselves is to go hide. Mm -hmm. And so they went up very high into the Andes Mount, Andes, Am I pronouncing that right? The Andes yes. Mountains. And um, in the 1950s, they, well, they had a prophecy that said when the glaciers start to melt, then we need to come back. Yeah. And um, oh my God. yeah, so. <laughs> That's a harsh <laughs> environment too. It, 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 oh my gosh. Yeah. Like the flowers that grow there are like micro flowers. Like it's just, yeah. Mm. Like potatoes, maca, and llama, and yeah. Um, and what's what's incredible is they came back, they returned. Oh, she froze. Yeah. yeah. Being maintained. Could um, you repeat that? You froze for a moment, so. Oh, sorry. sorry. So they, so 500 years later, they came back to the city of Cusco on the very day that Inti, the sun god, was being celebrated. You mean they just walked in, said hi, we're back? Yeah. I mean, they basically, they to this day, they still believe in walking everywhere. So let's say if they're going to travel to another part of the world, they need to catch an airline. They will walk for like four days from their village to kind of more Western civilization where they'll pick up a car. Mm. But they still believe, like they won't ride a donkey or something. Like they still that's, believe. That's a transition because they, they give some time to settle into a new way of being. Yeah. So that's pretty. Cool. Yeah, and I I guess the reason I'm sharing this is their whole religion is based around seeds. Mm. And <laughs> yeah, <Yay>. so, <laughs> so they have like like mesas, which are portable altars that's considered their medicine bundle. And there's like these metaphoric seeds and then you even put real seeds in there to nourish your spiritual objects mm. and when they give spiritual or energetic transmissions they actually blow like spiritual or energetic seeds into mm. the person so they believe with shamanism um that they actually the shaman will blow the entire seed of you becoming a shaman into you on your very first um, experience. It's not about like, oh, we're going to grant you this like certificate or title after you've studied for decades. It's like, no, we're going to give you the entire seed up front and then you, you grow it and you nurture it. So there's Westerners traveling from all over the world and they're like, no, this, this knowledge belongs to everyone. It's our heritage. And they just give everybody the seed and they're like, it's up to you to then nurture it and see what kind of shaman you become, you know, because you've got your your own seed. Yeah. Your, own, your own destiny, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. your own mission here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How beautiful. Well, okay. when we're you get back you from, up for a Sunday, Lee. Yeah. We want to hear more about it. When you get back from the Amazon, maybe join us in September because Janet. But your internet's you better. Us, we'll yeah. be doing our, we're doing our intensive and we need to have some yeah, wonderful I, table. And Janet will be on our intensive. Yeah, yeah that's in right. September for the equinox. I, yeah. I, I, and Miriam said this, this also, the same kind of thing of initiation in yoga when you're giving your seed mantra. So oh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Oh, wow. what, what's the name of the people again? Tony was asking, uh, asking you. How do you spell it? 
Well, should be giving you a walk. Uh, Somebody's mics are on. One second. Yeah. I put it in the chat room. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's oh, what I'm trying to do. Thank you. We appreciate okay. it. Okay. I'm going to let me see. Okay, John, you're up. John Berger. Let me see. Here you are. Hey, John. Yep. Oh, you have a poor connection. You have a bad connection. Um, can you hear him, um, Janet? And and Lee put the uh, spelling of that tribe Q E R O. Quero. Uh, John, you don't have a good connection, unfortunately. We're not hearing you. No. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, then I will. I will leave on the floor, so to speak. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. Just throw, throw it in. Throw it in the chat room. Could you chat? Type it yeah, up and then read it. it. Yeah. In the chat room. Okay, that would be good. Who okay. else? Follow and Judith questions? is saying she feels compelled to mention the. Vandanta Shiva and Navdanya Institute that save seeds. Right. So many, so many, the call to protect the heirloom seeds and the, the seeds and so many institutes. What's seeds weird is changed. so many of them burned down and you wonder who's behind that, mm. right? We've just heard that, of that. That is, that, that's a very special institute as well. Yeah. I don't know much about Thank you, Judith. The repositories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, same yeah. kind of initiation in yoga when you're giving a seed mantra, says Miriam. So. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. Well, this is this is fascinating, and you know it's, we're tying together so many different traditions. But seeing but the stories, the stories of the story at the basis <laughs> of humanity, no matter what culture. No matter oh, wouldn't what, Joseph Campbell have fun today looking at all these and finding their and he did their yeah. essential steps? Well, well that, that's what that's what I write in the blurb of my book. It's as if Joseph Campbell had met. Carl Jung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. So, oh, also, okay. Uh, Asherah, A S H E R A. Yeah, absolutely. -A -A. Asherah is a really good one because yeah. Asherah, Asherah are the trees that was the great goddess. Asherah, they're called Asherah, were the groves of trees. The Asherot were the grove <laughs> of trees. That mm -hmm. were the where people and the, and the Hebrews were built, busy tearing them down. But it has other incredible meanings because it says uh, when when God says I am that I am Ayer Asher Aya is is what it says. So that's the same root. I am yeah. that I am, and it also can mean blessing. So it could be I am blessing that I am, and it also a share. Is also the root of the word for the navel or the the umbilical cord. Yes. Oh my gosh! Yeah. And There's could a you share is a very a, a beautiful, beautiful word. Yeah, and thank you, John, for posing that. Um, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. We're just familiar with the tree of life in our experiential work because so often our feet grow roots deep into Mother Earth. Our body our trunk grows up to the heavens or we're branching out into the cosmos tree of life you become that i'm not that familiar with the tree of knowledge could you explain the two as they were well, there's again you know with this knowledge there's so many different layers of it right. but so in in the kabbalah at least it, or at least in, in the the behind the kabbalah the tree of life is the oneness basically the the the, the creation all of creation the tree of knowledge is the tree of knowledge is good and evil. So it's the tree of knowledge of duality. Mm -hmm. And for us to be born, for us to come to earth and have a life, there has to be duality because we we can't we can't exist in oneness. We need to, we need to have this this physical body. So we yeah. need to be here as a male or a female or in whatever gender we we consider ourselves. But we need to have that experience to have life. So the tree of knowledge is considered the tree of duality. And in the, the, the Kabbalah tree, if, if, if you can picture it, there's that main tree, which is the tree of life, is the center post. And then there's the two posts on the side. One is the, the supernal male, the other is the supernal female, and they interact as, as, a, as, a, as a map of creation. And I would say that journey with the, the tent flap, where it goes in both directions, is really also, I mean, so many layers of that. But what we find is the one, the, the void, the all potentiality. I mean, it's interesting to experientially 
people describe that. We've described it that way. You just seem to be in a sea of vast potential, mm -hmm. the seeds but you, that have not yet sprouted, but everything is there, the all. And then you've got this beautiful tapestry of life as it spins out in all directions, it's myriad forms that it takes, and both are so beautiful. And, you, you know, there's no contest between them. It's just that it's all there for the joy and the discovery and the playground. You don't want to sit, stay in one stasis state. You want to go and live your life, recycle back, live your life, recycle back. In this well, we might want to stay in stasis. We right. just can't. <laughs> Sometimes we want to crawl under those covers. Like, Please, world. <laughs> and, and it's all accessible. But this tent flap again, right? You need both. You need to, to have a foot in both worlds is how we, we describe it. And so, and that's the journey, right? Mm -hmm. That's the threshold that you cross again and again and again and build knowledge, build experience, build understanding. And with that compassion and yeah, it's just such a, it's so beautiful, the whole journey and the way it's constructed mm. that you just have to go in awe and wonder and, and just the immensity of it, the beauty of it. You, it's ecstasy, just contemplating. And I, that and I, do see Lee. I, I just, for some reason, this one popped up about the caduceus and absolutely. So you have the two serpents and yeah. by the way, a serpent is in the name and the word goddess in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Okay, uh, and, you have to explain the, that one. Yeah. So it's the, the goddess and the serpent are one, basically. The, the, the name of a serpent, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Maybe Hayat is the same, is basically a cognate of Eve, which is Hawa or Hava in Hebrew. So they're, they're, they're the same, basically. Okay. So they're, they're the serpent goddess, basically. And so you have this, these energies and they, it says they meet at the chakras, they, at the caduceus is the symbol of healing. So, so we have, it's the serpents that, that rise up. It's, it's it can be called Kundalini. Up your spine. Yeah. yeah that's spine. And, and spine is an interesting word as well. So ats is the, is a word for tree. Mm -hmm. if you add the breast syllable, ats ha, it means spine. Mm. So we have our own tree of life. Yep. Our own tree in our bodies as above, so below. Yep. Wow. <laughs> See, isn't it beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. So um, feminism and religion. You often say it's really about all of humanity and religion. The F that word. You're, oh I yeah. Can you explain the F word? Or <laughs> I was naming it, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I came on to it's about 10 years old. I came on about three years ago uh-huh yeah. So. yeah yeah and i stand on the i stand on the shoulder of giants for that site because i'm like Re rose mary ruther uh and cal christ and others founders of that site real feminist thinkers and really part of it is about bringing the goddess back so that we have that balance of both the patriarchy yeah, and the matriarchy and together it, yeah and yes, i, I have to society is honored by i have to interject of course we want to bring back the sacred masculinity as well that 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 that, it, that yeah. also is something that has to balance it out the two together so that the patriarchy is one thing but the sacred masculine is another and so there's another whole role and relationship yeah. that the male brings to the table that in a proper way is the balancing point that that that, that fulfills, allows fulfills that loop yeah. yeah. Somebody in a female body could bring the male to the table. Yeah, right. I'm not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody in a male <laughs> body could bring the female to the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we'll get to a time when it just doesn't matter however you express yourself, right? That's mm -hmm. what we want to get to. Yeah. yeah like yeah. celebrate all expressions. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, in the last 10 minutes that we have, if you want to raise your hand, make a comment, pose it to the chat room. Um, so, please do so now. And we want to, uh, wind up oh page the serpent is a symbol of transformation because it sheds its skin yeah it's a member of the yeah lower world as well as and john was world. and john was asking does the egyptian hieroglyph include a symbol for the serpent uh, it's, 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 it's like almost like a, a a lightning bolt oh yeah oh yeah that that's... And then the serpent is because uh, besides uh, the uh, shedding skin it's also an earth symbol and a heaven symbol, the earth because it goes under the ground and heavens because like Persephone it's Persephone comes yeah. up again. Yeah. And look yeah. at its undulating waves, right? It's sinuous undulating waves, how waves propagate through nature. 
um, and energy uh, does that. And it's also interesting that Chinese celebrate it, the Mesoamericans celebrate the serpent. Um, so it's a very ancient yes. symbol. And yeah. you know, we've reached a point now where the, the, the term shamanism catches a lot of baggage as well. It's not necessarily a, a clear uh, path to what the term means sometimes. So you have to make a definition of that because of the fact that it's been layered on just like the Christianity or anything else. It, it continues to expand and be included in a lot of other things yeah. that it's not just a simple a simple word that tells you exactly what it means. We know the tradition going all the way back to the origins of the word, but nowadays the way that it's in neuro shamanism, the way that it's being adapted and used. And can so, we stop arguing over the term is comes from a certain shaman and a certain part of the, come on, it's a universal well, worldwide yeah. experiential teaching. It's groundwork to us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why sometimes people use terms, uh, such as wisdom traditions and other terms to our ancient yeah. uh, uh, indigenous traditions or whatever, and not use the word shamanism constantly because it's it's gathered a lot of what I, what I think of as baggage. But how do you feel about that? I look at the roots of it. Yeah. I, I, I think the serpent energy is incredibly powerful, incredibly important energy. Beautifully said. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I appreciate how before science, before written language, before all of this, so we go back to our first and our beginnings and how we're expressing through art, writing on the cave wall, using symbols, symbol that the entire culture would know the meaning of, and it would be deeply layered, deep meanings over it. And you would find it um, in, in various aspects of life, the vegetation that dies in the winter and is regrown, right? The meaning of the soul, diving deep, mother earth and the sky. And it's really, I mean, you would find it. So it's written in symbol. It's written in this deep meaning. That was our first language, how we communicated, how we understood the world. And so I appreciate that you're going back and looking and recovering this in your own tradition of the Hebrew Bible in, in uh, shamanism and all of this. Where do you go yeah, next? That's where the mystery school. The yeah. mystery schools. Thank you in reviving them for today um where do you go next what is the next area of your of your research Book number five yeah are you going to allow me to breathe <laughs> yeah. to the uh, actually actually yeah. i do i do translations of hebrew passages the, the you know the poetics of the bible are very beautiful but they can uh -huh. be very patriarchal so i do alternative translations i yeah. don't know what i'm going to do with it yet but i i enjoy playing with that do you have one um at hand that you want to share uh -huh. I don't have anything. I'm sorry, no. I don't have one right here. <laughs> Do you want to lead us in a um, vocalization yeah, of, we can the, together. of the 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 uh, powerful yeah. power? Symbols. We can all join along. Uh, yeah. so what would you like to do with the last few minutes? We could just do the yaha va ha. Just do that. Mm -hmm. it's very simple. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, it, I, 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 just because it's simple. Or yeah. we can even do, or, or maybe better, the Allahuya. Everybody knows that. Allahuya, which are these syllables from Hallelujah. Ah, from Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting that that, ta that song is now so popular. Oh. Uh, it's interesting when some of this stuff bubbles up, we hear it on some deep level. Mm -hmm. We resonate towards it in our culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're still tuned to all this deep mystery and it's knowledge, aren't we? And it shows up. The uh, most comments we got from our community host of last Sunday, when you talked about the, the God words and mm -hmm. was that, we heard that commented more than anything. Oh yeah. So people yeah. know, yeah. we know this yeah. on some deep level. So yeah. you, why, why not do something to share with us right now? I, I can't turn everybody's mics on because it's a cacophony that well, why it, you try it? it doesn't work. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> Zoom is horrible for this part of it. Because of the delays, you know. So everybody, do it, do it. Everybody can do it themselves, along with Janet leading us. And I suggest, and it's just a suggestion, yeah. is that you hold one of your chakras. Oh, yeah. chakra, well, let's do it or, with the or your, yeah. or your or your uh, yeah. um, Hara chakra, or even okay. your throat chakra. Whatever chakra speaks to you, if you're so called to do it in that in that format. Because your hands are activating those chakras. This is a good one that we call healing, right? Yes. 
is yes. one of our postures. Let's try this one. Okay. Yeah, that one with Bart, yeah. Bart, the solar plexus. Right. Connect those up. Right above the left. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, you lead us in one. Okay, so we just, just do it for a minute, I suppose, because we're short, short of time. But um, I tend to have a very low voice, but everybody do what resonates for you. So. Ah, Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, you, like I seven times felt like the right number. <laughs> so yeah. I have to tell you a quick, quick story about vibration and toning okay. and how some of this ancient wisdom was employed. So we go to Egypt and we go into the king's chamber. We we go with a guy, it was John Anthony West several yeah. years ago, and he's yeah. arranged for our good. group to just like have some special time in the king's chamber. And so we'd been toning outside in the open air, and we sounded like a collection of cats wailing, right? Everybody toning. But the same group, we go into the great uh, chamber, which is sacred geometry proportions, and so it knows how to contain sound and resonate with it, you know, whatever it's doing to the sound. And we sound like a choir of angels, the same group. And so I really, yeah. I really, you know, that was a big lesson Initiation. in the ancient wisdom that understands the importance of activation of our own bodies, our own physiology, and what we can do with it, and how it transmutes into something of beauty, and where we can join the this symphony of the the spheres, right? The, the music of the spheres. We can become one with that. Yeah. And I thought, wow, you know, so much wisdom there. How they didn't need so so. This. <laughs> yeah. uh. so, so beautiful, Janet. Yeah. Thank you for decoding uh, this for us. Yeah. Thank you for all the knowledge that you're doing. Uh, do you want to mention your books and what they're about? Well, as this, well? This, one, this one just came out. It's, it's new. And it is my autobiography, Desperately Seeking Persephone. And, Love and, it's, the about my, and it's, yeah, it's about my journey. So I write about my shamanic initiations. I write about these shamanic journeys that I've taken. And I write about, I, 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 although I do have to mention what I'm healing from, I, I like to think of this as a book of healing rather than a book of, rather than a book of, uh, yeah. of, um, and by the way, I said, I, I, what I write, wrote was if uh, Joseph, if, uh, Indiana Jones met Carl Jung. It was if Indiana Jones met met um, Joseph Campbell is what this book is about because because I because I traveled to many different places in the world and the, my idea was was because I dif different places in the world resonate differently with us and that was part of my healing journey was to do that. So mm -hmm. this this is what I write about is the healing journey. Yeah, and how I found wholeness. And, and how I, often our own wounds and our own journey towards healing is what their whole initiation is about yeah. ah, when moses was a shaman and then he was a goddess he so. was a goddess <laughs> i'm not holding up the one but i can hold up the one goddess. this was actually my first book and perhaps my favorite because it's the most comprehensive but i have to say people had trouble understanding it it was my first four way ray trying to explain all of these concepts that i was seeing but but needed to then translate in a way that other people could understand them so mm -hmm. these other two books have shorter lessons. They're very short chapters. They're told with stories a little bit more. So I just think it's more accessible yeah. than, uh -huh. than the one God's book. <laughs> well, thank you. Fantastic. Well, interesting. And I, uh, I'm really looking forward to the insights that you will have 
uh, and forthcoming more on our work here at the Institute. And I appreciate yeah. that you'll be well, so joining our yeah. Equinox um, in celebration as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. uh, we really want to say thank you and what an amazing. So much amount more. Of data so research. much more that you have that, that right. I knew in the beginning. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so. Before we leave, let's turn off. Everybody uh, turn on your mics. And everybody should say thank you to our guests and, and to each other for being here today. I think it was quite a powerful experience, I hope, for all of you. So let's let's hear you say thank you. I think we just touched thank the key. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thank, thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, Janet. That's a any final thoughts you want to share, Janet? You know what? I'll just say thank you in Hawaiian, which is just again those gentle vibrational essence. Mahalo. 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 Mahalo.